Hi everybody, I'm Jim Stogdall. I'm here with Tim O'Reilly. Uh, welcome to our live cast today. We're going to be talking about the collision between hardware and software. And towards the end we'll be taking questions and I'm going to keep that part short and move right into the conversation. Hi Tim. Hi. Uh, I'm super excited about this. Uh, the thing that I really want to get across in this conversation is that we're at one of those huge inflection points in the industry. You know, it's funny because for some time everyone was thinking it was mobile. And then, well, maybe it's wearables. Uh, but actually, it's way, way bigger than that. Uh, it's everything from the kinds of trends that we've been covering in Make. And actually, those go back even long before we launched Make magazine mm -hmm. in 2005 yeah. uh, to our uh, first peer-to-peer -peer, uh, conference in 2001. We featured a, uh, a talk on the implications of uh, you know, 3D printing you know, for peer-to-peer, -peer, that people would be shipping around designs, sharing right. them on the net. Uh, you know, we've been following this stuff for a long time, you know, and so there's the whole thread of the maker movement, people just getting interested in hardware, uh, figuring out how to make stuff. And then, you know, at some point it tips over from something that people are doing uh, in their spare time that's cool uh, just for fun and turns into, whoa, this is the next big thing. Yeah, and you start, we started seeing things happening at all different levels from, from industry on down. And, you know, we, were, it, we started off thinking about things in a DIY sense, but we've seen it all over the place now. Yeah, and I, I think uh, the thing that we're trying to do with our solid event is really draw the big picture of where this movement is going and mm -hmm. what it includes. Because it's really easy for people to latch onto a term uh, like the Internet of Things right. and make it too small. Mm -hmm. Because it's way bigger than just, quote, the Internet of Things. Or uh, maybe the Internet of Things is, uh, is the underpinning. But what happens when you have an Internet of Things? Uh, you know, what happens is that you're able to rethink the way businesses work. You're able to rethink the way uh, you manage processes, the mm -hmm. way you do stuff. Uh, and, and there's so many interesting sidelights. And we're really trying to put together a big tent. Yeah. And I think you've done a great job on that, of, of, of telling a story about, whoa, 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 what does 3D printing have to do with DIY bio, have to do with jet engines that uh, call for service, yeah. uh, you know, with... Yeah we, were Every, sitting, yeah, we were sitting down in a conference room in Sebastopol about a year ago and we were sort of talking through all these things, everything from robotics to, to maker stuff to smart grid and smart cities and sort of thinking about which things should we focus on. And it was really obvious that really they're all the same in a way. Um, and that the things that are, the, the conversations a lot of people are having, are having are too tightly oriented around a specific piece of it. But it is like talking about the elephant's leg rather than the whole, yeah. the whole thing. Yeah. We've tried to... You know, we tried to put together a set of themes that we thought described what these things. I'm frankly still not sure that we've captured all of them. I think what all this stuff means is still sort of settling in our heads about how it all fits together. Absolutely, and yeah. I'm hoping that during the Q&A part of this uh, webcast that we'll actually get some really good input from mm -hmm. people. You know, I remember when I was doing my brainstorming about Web 2.0, having a bunch of public sessions where I was like, hey, here's something I'm thinking through. Mm -hmm. How do all these things fit together? Yeah. You know, there's, there's big data, which we were talking about back in 2004, you know, collective intelligence, uh, lightweight user interfaces. And somehow out of all that emerged a storyline. And I think in a similar way, you know, we're looking at lightweight manufacturing. We're mm -hmm. looking at new kinds of logistics. We're looking at robotics. We're looking at... Uh, you know, design beyond the screen, and all these things have something to do with each other. Yeah. And uh, it's through examples of, of companies sort of searching out, uh, and inventors really searching out the possibilities in those spaces that we start to go, oh, now I understand. Yeah, and the really, one of the really interesting things that got us thinking about this or focused on it was the fact that we saw people in our uh, ecosystem who had been historically serial software entrepreneurs suddenly disappearing to do things with hardware. Yeah. And so, you know, we know there's a lot of things going on, but one of the clear things is, is that the necessary hurdle to get involved in hardware, because of the availability of design tools, the ability to prototype faster, the ability to have a ready supply chain to manufacturing, et cetera, uh, is really changing that dynamic. Um, hardware's still hard. 
Yeah. And we don't want to go out, you know, we don't want to be viewed as saying, oh, so suddenly hardware is as malleable as software. But hardware is becoming a lot more malleable. And what's interesting about that is that hardware as a malleable medium makes it amenable to things like lean. Yeah. You know, you suddenly can have tighter feedback loops in your processes um, when you're not looking at a hundred million dollars investment and in three years. Right. To well, I'm something. saying I was just visiting yeah. Adafruit in New York recently, and there's Lamar Freed at her design station, and her factory floor is right behind her, mm -hmm. where they're actually manufacturing the stuff, and she's in the warehouse and their media studio. Kind of, they've got an integrated operation, and sure, they order a lot of components right. from China, but she's really sitting there in, in the south of the side of Manhattan, you know, with a, a, a you know, a soup to nuts hardware factory. Yeah. So it is, it is actually getting lighter. And even, you know, if you're not, uh, you know, making small scale stuff like Lemoore, you want to make something bigger, you want to make it at scale. You, there's, not, there's not that great a distance between the hard parts of the software business, which have been abstracted, you know, so the fact that you can, mm -hmm. uh, you know, put up a service that has you know, millions and millions of users without owning any servers, that's pretty new. Well, the fact that you can come up with a hardware design and get it manufactured without ever having a factory, I think is, is also something that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what do you say, the, the hurdles have gotten lower. And, and what, yeah, it's interesting. We saw evidence of this starting to happen in a different place some years ago when, for example, Facebook started the Open Compute Project. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there was sort of a level of scale which was small for the time, yeah. but made doing your own hardware seem possible. And then since then, we've just seen that slide down the curve yeah. tremendously, and you know, much more interesting things happening all along that curve. Um, and it's interesting, too, because if the hurdle's lower, you can do things for a much smaller market. And so that's what we're seeing with things like Kickstarter, where you can yeah. successfully develop something that does not necessarily have to have the same degree of mass market penetration. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, I want to jump a little bit to the subject of design. Mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you know, if you think about sort of stages of the industry, uh, there's a, um, you know, there have been massive dislocations for developers. Mm -hmm. There have been massive dislocations for designers. You, yeah. know, you think about all those people who were used to designing print brochures, mm -hmm. and then they had to become web designers. Then they had to become mobile designers. And now it's like, oh, well, we need industrial designers. But more than that, I think we also need uh, people who are you know, process designers, who are thinking about um, you know, building something that's a, a mm. real world service. Or yeah. serv you know, they're really service designers. Right. You know, Uber is a product of a certain kind of design thinking, so is Airbnb. Mm -hmm. um, and they are actually, you know, the, even though they're, they're the further out reaches of this phenomenon we're talking about, right. They are partly enabled by, um, you know, the tools that we're talking about. Right. You know, uh, well, certainly, certainly Uber is. You know, the fact that, that you have these mobile sensors that we're all carrying around. Yeah. You know, we are part of the Internet of Things. Yeah, we are. You know, a lot of people yeah. like to think of the Internet of Things as devices that are just doing it on their own. Right. But I continue to feel that one of the central ideas of our age is of, you know, collective intelligence. Uh, you know, and man-machine symbiosis, big ideas that, you know, I've talked about for years. And, you know, even, even something like a Nest thermostat, you know, it's like, even though, even if we never touch it and it's just observing us coming in at, to and out of our house to establish mm -hmm. our schedule, we are providing input to it. Well, that's a really, it's an interesting example because one of the things that you look for in this is not just the fact that, say, a print designer had to become a web designer, yeah. but where different disciplines are colliding. And you yeah. know, we've seen that with web and ops, yeah, yeah. Right? What, um, ops and development colliding. Right. You sort of get this new discipline, right? I think we're seeing very similar thing in design where suddenly the people behind the scenes doing machine learning are as much a part of the design yeah. of the ultimate product. Um, yeah. you know, we were, we've spent some focus on um, you know, design as computers helping you, right? To yeah. sort of the behind the scenes. And that is as much about the data yeah. and the developers behind the scenes working with those. T totally, yeah. yeah, I mean, so designing with data is a huge part of this. Designing, you know, for me, th there's a fundamental thing. You know, again, take, take Nest as an example. You know, beautifully designed physical object, and it's easy to say, oh, that's the design part of this. Right. But the real design part of it is, uh, you know, how do you actually change the interaction with a thermostat? Mm -hmm. and, and did they get that right? 
You know, right. uh, same thing with uh, all the people who are doing smart locks. You yeah. know, yeah. Uh, you know, somebody's going to nail it, and a lot of that is going to be a design problem. Somebody says, "Oh yeah, I realized we didn't actually have to have somebody, you know, clicking little buttons on the smartphone. You know, we could detect, uh, you know, different things, mm -hmm. and based on that, remove any need for human input." Right. Uh, I was talking with a, a kind of an alpha geek, you know, the term I use for people who are just able to do whatever they want with technology. Guy who's a former uh, Google and Facebook engineer is now building his own home. Mm -hmm. And he was saying, well, you know, I don't know where all the sort of home sensor stuff is going. I realized I could do it all with cameras. So I've got cameras in every, you know, doorway and I just, I can do, so I can estimate the height of the person entering the room and that way I can figure out uh, you know, w which of my kids is coming in so I can play their music, you know? Right, right. <laughs> you know, kind of, you know, and it's like, it's not product, uh, you know, yeah. but it sort of shows mm -hmm. people are just sort of, you know, using this wonderful idea that I, I got from the poet Wallace Stevens, searching the possible for its possibleness. Right. You know, it's just yeah. lovely, you know, just see people, going, oh, I wonder if we, you know, used a sensor in this way, we could take this piece out of the, manual instructions, you know, and so this notion that we're going to be, you know, that we're here with our smartphone, mm -hmm. you know, hitting buttons is going to seem kind of quaint. It's going to be the, right. you know, the, the uh, green screen CRT. It's going to be direct interaction of a variety of kinds. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's, I, ta I, had, I think I had a conversation with the same guy, and it's interesting, not only is what he's doing demonstrating interesting possibilities, mm -hmm. but he's also demonstrating to himself at least uh, what a lot of the missing parts are right now, yeah. just sort of making this world truly generative and generative in the sense that, yeah. you know, innovation coming from unexpected places. The hardware components and all the things he needs are there. But when I asked him what was the biggest problem he had with this, he said, uh, um, uh, code deployment. Mm -hmm. You know, like he's got, I don't know, a large number of devices that are running code in his house now, and code deployment is not push a button and out it goes. There is no, you know, uh, no, um, uh, Jenkins for yeah. your home, yeah. for your home Raspberry Pis, right? So like he goes around with a USB key to 40 or 50 devices that he's had to have, you know, little access places coming out of the side of his countertops or whatever to get to, mm -hmm. and he manually deploys code and then tests it in place. Yeah, it, so it sort of, um, yeah, it brings up the whole subject of, you know, open source, open data, open protocols, mm -hmm. which have been so central for the internet and still somewhat absent from the way people are thinking about the Internet of Things. Yeah. Uh, certainly there are people who are coming at this from an open source perspective, but we are seeing a lot of proprietary apps. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, it's probably coming more from the, from the app culture than the open source Internet culture, and that's certainly an issue that, you know, from an advocacy point of view, we want to address, yeah. you know, in our events in this space. Yeah, you know, at the physical layer, you're starting to see, or at the lower layers of the stack, we're seeing things like MQTT come out, an open messaging protocol. Uh, there was an article on Make Magazine recently about um, an Internet of Things toolkit, which was an open source effort to do that lower level uh, connection yeah. stuff. But the business models people are choosing still aren't really taking advantage of that. Yeah. So each device, each thing that comes out, whether it's a wearable or an Internet of Things kind of component, are generally adopting a model of uh, trying to use their device as the leverage Right. To get to be the owner of the biggest data store right. around, and, yeah, and, and and the controller is you know a smartphone app, yeah. you know, and yeah. you're talking a proprietary protocol right. to their proprietary device, yeah. and I think, you know, there's some point where th there's different possible futures. One, you know, somebody wins, you mm -hmm. know, and you know, um, you end up with all these devices talking to each other because they're owned by the same company or right. they're part of. You know, this is the Apple Internet of Things, and this is the Google Internet of Things, and this is the GE Internet of Big Things. Right, uh, you right, know? right. And uh, that's not really the world that we want to see. Mm -hmm. We want to see, you know, we need to figure out what does interoperability look like? Yeah. Uh, and uh, how do people capture value? Because I do think it's important for companies to be able to, to make money, but I want them to make more money because they make this thing more generative, uh, more widely used, more useful, and so more yeah. people yeah, That's the challenge. If you're right. selling a thing, yeah. and it's untethered from uh, the data collection and all that mm -hmm. stuff, you lose the opportunity to monetize it on the backside, and you're stuck just selling a thing, right? So everybody, I think that's one of the drivers that's pushing people in that direction. Um, Maybe, but it seems to me that 
if you really understand that the power is in the data, you know, then you build a beautiful thing, you get it widely deployed, uh, you're able to deliver better services because you have more data. It has the same dynamics that really drove winner takes all in the Web 2.0 era, which is, hey, you know, it's very hard to have a search engine that's better than Google because they got more data right. too early. By the time everybody else is running along, they're trying to catch up, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, you can't be as good. And I think there's going to be a kind of a race that isn't going to depend on proprietary hardware. It's going to be, I built a kick-ass service and it became so useful uh, that it generated so much data that made it more useful over time and everybody mm -hmm. else will have a cold start problem. Yeah. You know, we've uh, been sort of focusing a little bit on Internet of Things kinds of things here. Yeah. Um, we're also looking at everything from drones and robotics and those sorts yeah. of things as well. Robotics are interesting because they were sort of the precursor to this idea of hardware and software colliding. Right. You know, the reason, so we're doing a conference, we're calling it Solid. One of the reasons we're calling it Solid is because it's about the sort of software development community coming out of the virtual world back into the real world, and mm -hmm. we're sort of trying to convey that solidity, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but roboticists are interesting in that for years they've already been doing that. I mean, a, if you're a roboticist, you have to be essentially a physicist, a mechanical engineer, electrical engineer, and a software programmer, yeah. or at least have all those pieces on your team. So they've sort of laid the groundwork for what yeah. this might look like for a lot of people. And I suspect that um, one of the things beyond the technology that will be really interesting to watch play out is the transformation of organizations. Yeah. As their engineering teams have to adapt and look different to bring these things together in ways they didn't previously bring them together. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, that the, the mix of skills is different. Mm -hmm. But you also, there's something in, when you bring up robotics, that I think it's really worth thinking about. You know, our idea of a robot, going back to science fiction, uh, is always of this sort of autonomous mm -hmm. device, eventually, you know, sort of right. autonomously intelligent. And the reality is that we are surrounded by robots. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a washing machine is a robot, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's just not a very smart one. You know, a, uh, uh, you know and, and our things are becoming smarter all the time. Right. And, uh, you know, you see that in, in uh, you know, again, you know, what is the nest? But it's just a, a smarter heating system robot right. than we used to have. In so we're seeing this evolution of, so, so when you talk about robotics, to me there's, there's the part about the intelligence part, which may not look like a robot at all. You may not be in the robot even. Right, right, yeah, yeah exactly, <laughs> yeah, the robots are connected. Right. And then there's the, the, you know, the thing, the, the stuff that does things. Mm -hmm. and, and even there it may not, it may, you know, you may have more capability uh, to interact with the physical world without actual autonomous intelligence. So a lot of the drones are really just, you know, remote control aircraft, just a lot more powerful. They're mobile, they're mobile sensors <laughs> yeah. attached to a robot that has no physical presence at all. That's right, you know, yeah. and, and so we're, we're um, you know, so the, and, and, and I think it's super important to understand when you think about sensors that it's a little bit like what they talk about with, with AI. You know, mm -hmm. as soon as it become, as it starts working, you say, oh, that's not AI, you know? And the sensors that are omnipresent, we don't think of as sensors. We just mm -hmm. think of them as capabilities. Right. You know, so a camera is a sensor, a microphone is a sensor. And, you know, so there's one interesting thing, which is, you know, so the UI changes that come from having, you know, cameras and machine vision and the UI sensors, the, the UI changes that come from having speech recognition are, you know, almost like templates for other types of sensors. You know, what do you do differently when you have an accelerometer? You know, we've started to discover that in the last, right, right. you know, uh, few years. And I love like my, Mo my Moto X, it automatically knows, hey, you're driving. You know, you just got a text. Would you like me to read it to you? Right, you know, right. that's a super cool, you know, again, thinking the sensor lets you mm -hmm. do something different with, with, with the UI, which kind of brings us back around to this design issue. Yeah. But manufacturing. Let's talk about manufacturing. Yeah. Um, kind of two pieces of it that are interesting right now, I think. Um, one is this notion we call frictionless manufacturing, which mm -hmm. is the, just the idea that a manufacturing supply chain is much easier to obtain now than it was before. So we've had John Bruner, our chair for the Solid Conferences, visited Shenzhen, China, for example, and spent yeah. time over there. 
And you know, there's actually a small community of ex Silicon Valley types that have sort of gone over there thinking they'd spend a little time and didn't come back. You know, yeah, so yeah. there is this piece now where manufacturing your idea is accessible because of that. Um, and actually, and before I come to the second idea, what's interesting about that is it's sort of if hardware components to things really do become a big part of what Silicon Valley is about, mm -hmm. then we have sort of this celestial mechanics thing going on between China and Silicon Valley where they're both offering different components to this overall whole and sort yeah. of circling around each other. Yeah. And it'll be an interesting question to see sort of where the advantages shift back and forth based on yeah. what's important in that ecosystem versus what's not. Yeah. Um, and then the other side of manufacturing that's super interesting is advanced manufacturing. Yeah. Um, the ability to do things uh, by sort of trading um, yeah. uh, information for, yeah. you know, for, for people on the floor, for right. be able to rapidly deliver things, be able to follow a supply chain all the way through from where th something was originally built. Um, so there's yeah, it, lots of interesting things happening. in manufacturing. There's a couple of things though, uh, about manufacturing that are, are worth talking about. One is, uh, you know, it's easy to think China, but mm -hmm. I noticed that, you know, like of the O'Reilly Alpha Tech Ventures portfolio companies uh, that are in the hardware business, uh, they're not necessarily, you know, not necessarily There's a big China move based. back here too, yeah. 3D Robotics has mm -hmm. its factory Mexico. in Mexico. Yep. Uh, you know, Planet Labs, which makes shoebox satellites, makes them mm -hmm. right here in San Francisco. Yeah. And um, if, if you, um, if through advances in manufacturing, you, take a lot of the labor component out of it, mm -hmm. then there's no more advantage necessarily for being in a lower labor environment, lower cost in labor yeah. environment. And the benefits of having a faster feedback loop for being close to your designers um, yeah. begin to be much more It's sort of an important. interesting point there. There was an article I just read this morning that, talk, that talked in passing about how AWS is responsible for the demographic shift from Silicon Valley to San Francisco in terms of where companies are located. Interesting. You know, because in the old days, you actually needed to have more real estate because you had to have servers, yeah, you had right. to, you know, and so there's these subtle differences. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's super interesting to think about what are the actual, you know, this is another aspect of solid, you know, what are the actual shifts in where people are going to locate their businesses yeah. because of changes in manufacturing? Yeah. But there's another piece in the whole, uh, so there's the frictionless manufacturing side, i.e. it's getting easier to design something, have it built, uh, easier to prototype, and scale it up. Yeah. prototype go to, from prototype to, to scale up. Uh, but there's another part of manufacturing that I think is super interesting uh, and that I get a view into from my son-in-law, Saul Griffith, at Other Lab. He had this great line recently. Uh, I was talking to John Bruner about our solid conference and he said, well, you have to understand what we do is we replace materials with math, right, right. you know, and that sort of was his description of what their, yeah. you know, business is. And you look mm -hmm. at, the, they're doing all these really interesting products from, you know, soft yeah. inflatable mm -hmm. pneumatic robots to, uh, you know, to gas, uh, uh, pressurized natural mm -hmm. gas tanks that can be any arbitrary shape because they figured out right. a way to, to, to build the, the pressure vessels that's not the big, you know, Powerful, uh, you know. Well, you know, in, 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 uh, in you know, GE did the contest last year where they had they designed a new bracket for a jet engine and they yeah. reduced the weight by eighty percent. And that was a case of replacing it with crowdsourced math, mm -hmm. right, which is kind of doubly interesting. It's certainly math to make the bracket do what it has to do is functionally, but they didn't even have to supply it. Yeah, so it was kind of interesting. Yeah, and I was just uh, saw a super cool uh, demo of a uh, you know a, a router. You know, I don't mean an internet router. I mean a, a um, a router for carving out wood, mm -hmm. and uh, it's basically looks just like a handheld router, except it's a, C, a programmable CNC machine. It knows what it's making. How does uh, it? How does it move? What's I actually actual, I haven't got, gotten the demo yet. I just okay. done the video, but it's super awesome. You know the idea yeah. of just how we're going to you know remake our power tools, yeah. or for that matter, you already know that with the power tools, you know, with the the saw blade that stops if it touches something soft. Right, right. You know, it's right. like there's 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 just there's so many things that are really already hitting consumer products that are yeah. a result of, of this revolution. And, and there's just going to be more and more and more of it. I think that's actually one of the hardest things about all this is sort of the art of, art, art of the possible is so unconstrained yeah. that it's almost, I mean, I kind of feel like we're at that stage where we're still making movies by putting the actors on a stage. Yeah. Right? And we just haven't even figured out how to break out of that box yet about what all this is really going to mean. Um, but yeah, it's... Uh, it, it, 
phenomenal opportunities out there. And you get little hints of it here and there of things, people yeah. trying things that just sort of leave you speechless that it was so interesting. Yeah, yeah. and I guess that comes back to what you guys are trying to do with the Solid Conference, which is to give enough of a taste of some of the edges of possibility that, that it, it triggers more creative thinking. You know, mm -hmm. So people who are sitting there going, well, you know, I, I was trying to figure out, I want to build an app. And you go, well, have you thought about you know, how you would totally remake some industry because you right. can now with, you know, with sensors and, mm -hmm. and UI that's based on that or mm -hmm. you know, uh, disruption based on actual making of stuff that would, you know, again, yeah. Square is a great example, you right. know, where it's really, it's a software company, uh, you know, but they started out with a little hardware dongle. And the, and, and the and fact that that little dongle, dongle replaced you know, all the other hardware components that used to serve that purpose, they were much right. more complicated, much more expensive. That's right. They, and they managed to get you to, they essentially got you to supply your own component through your iPad or phone. That's right, it's yeah. throw away, you know, device mm -hmm. that then takes commodity hardware, iPhone, iPad, and turns it into, you know, components of this point of sale system, which, you know, is totally yeah. transformative. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that, that uh, there's probably going to be a lot of of cases like that where it doesn't take that much to tweak the stuff we've got. Yeah. I think it's also going to be interesting to watch, you know, we, um, as we were developing the program for Solid, there's always this sort of line between what we do there and what we do for Strata with our, our data yeah. oriented. Because so much of this stuff is going to be about the data at the back end that yeah. creates the business or makes. Um, it's one of those areas that we, you know, they're sort of separate enough that it makes sense to keep them as separate ideas, yeah. but they really are more and more going to be, you know, and, and the, so that, you know, the same things that apply as kind of countervailing arguments in data will apply here, you know, things yeah. like security and things like privacy of this data are interesting. Oh, I was absolutely. blown away that everybody loved Nest until it was bought by Google, and then everybody was freaking out that, oh my God, now Google knows when I walk across my living room. It's like That's right. They already sort of did, but um, that aside, it was really interesting, that visceral response that happened in, in yeah, I, I think that. Yeah, I think that's true. Uh, although I, I, I continue to have a, a sort of a contrarian view on privacy. I think, you know, not to go with Scott McNeil, who said, you have no privacy anymore, get over it. Right. I, I don't think that. But I do think that there's so many cases where the, the, the very thing that we find so useful mm -hmm. requires us to give up our privacy. So we will do it. Yeah. And so there will be companies, there will be people, there will be governments who have access to all this data about us. So if we assume that future, what do we have to do differently? And a lot of the attempts to deal with that problem are around, well, make them throw the data away. And you go, well, then the service isn't going to work. Right. You know, or make them, you know, and I go, no, what you do is you figure out what things you don't want them to do, and you make those things you know, illegal or carry penalties. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, we, ha we have a lot of cases where this, there are uh, data regimes that kind of follow that model. I think a good example is insider trading. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, you can get all the material non-public information you want, but if you have it, guess what? You can't trade on it. You know, yeah. So then people don't want to have it. Yeah, the critic would argue, well, that's yeah, true, yeah, that people yeah. either don't want it or... Uh, and sure, people cheat, yeah, and yeah. sometimes they get yeah. away with it, right. but sometimes they go to jail. Yeah. And I think we need to figure out, okay, yeah, you know, you have my, my you know, you, I've sequenced my genome, you have my personal health information, so now you can't discriminate against me, you know, by right. denying me insurance. Right. You know, that's the way the law needs to go mm -hmm. to deal with the future that we're heading into. You know, yes, you know, um, you know, you're going to know these things about me, so you can't sell that to, right. to, to certain kinds of parties. You can't, you know, you can't trade against me. Separate know? from the privacy bit, though, is certainly the the interesting side effect, which is that as your physical world gets a digital veneer, yeah, it's it has an attack surface it didn't have before. Yeah, um, and that's you know, it's a, I put digital thermostats in my house recently, and you can't figure. You know, I have no way of knowing did that vendor. Yeah. You know, what steps did they take to make them secure? So yeah. I went away on a long vacation and I actually disconnected them. You know, it's sort of like, I don't really want that to be available on the internet if I'm yeah. not around to see that somebody's screwing with it. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe I'm paranoid, but there, it does speak to the idea that a lot of things becoming digital that weren't before. Um, and a lot of stuff has a fair amount of legacy stuff, especially in the industrial space where we sort of see um, controllers going online that are based on 20-year-old technology. Yeah. Did not have 
the notion in their engineered designs yeah. that they'd ever be attached to anything. Yeah. Um, but again, I, I think that the, 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 you know, I may be naive, but I do think the model. I don't think you're of, naive. I think you're optimistic. Uh, okay, <laughs> optimistic. Uh, you know, yes, people can attack. There will be a lot more attack surfaces. Um, but there are attack know, like surfaces with physical actuators. With no, uh, I understand. Yeah. But uh, yeah. you know, if if you think about your physical security of your home, for mm -hmm. example, you know, a window is an attack surface. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, anyone can break it. Particularly yep. windows on the back of your house, yeah. out of sight, right? They yeah. can come around, break the window, get in. Nobody's around. Right. You know, uh, and if you're in a high crime area, yes, you put bars on the windows. Right. If you're not in a high crime area, you don't. I think that's know? a great analogy because in yeah. the same way, it's sort of like if you're depending on how high profile you are or not yeah. in certain ways or depending on what things you're doing, yeah. you may need to be more or less concerned about this. Um, yeah. Some of it's automated though, which yeah. makes that interesting. Yeah, yeah. so anyway, it's going to be, a, there's a sort of an evolving surface of, of concerns, uh, you know, measures, countermeasures, how we think about it. And I think being afraid of the future is the worst approach. Oh, I agree. Yeah. You know, you want to actually be excited about the future. And yeah, there's a few bumps, in, there's few, maybe a lot of bumps in the road, mm -hmm. but Hey, how much better is it to solve those problems? And, and that's the other thing I think that, I, I guess I was just talking about problems. The problems of the future, I think, are deeply, deeply uh, related to this solid space. Mm -hmm. You know, when we talk about, uh, you know, a, an issue like uh, global warming, for example, mm -hmm. you know, it will take solid capabilities yeah. to solve that. We will need to know, we have to instrument the physical world. We're yeah. gonna need to build services you know, to make the grid more resilient, to make our homes more energy efficient, to uh, you know, be able to track weather, you know, weather uh, for, for water use, for planting, for mm -hmm. agriculture. I mean, you know, solid in agriculture is gonna be, right. it's already huge. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got everything from you know, robotic uh, you know, harvesters and planters right. to, uh, uh, you know, sensor technology that lets you figure out exactly where to put it, put down the fertilizer yeah. based on the, the, the uh, what you can see from the, the light signature out of right. the plants that are growing there. You know, it's, a, it's, it's uh, good to mention the, the grid part in the relationship to bigger problems. Uh, a friend of mine is the head of smart grid for a large electrical equipment mm -hmm. manufacturer. Mm -hmm. He told me the story about a utility in the American South who, the, the way the system works is you put voltage out on there, you can't let the voltage anywhere on the grid get too low because it'll, it'll cause uh, current surges. So in the old days, they just maintained the voltage coming out of the generator high enough that they could guarantee that out there it would never get that yeah. low. Um, it's a lot of waste though. So what they did is they instrumented the entire grid in a way that they hadn't before, yeah. measured voltages at all these remote points on it, and then were able to balance the mm -hmm. loads through it to flatten the curve. Right. And then also by knowing where the lowest voltage was, they were able to reduce yeah. the output of the generator by 10 or 15 volts. Right. And s saved having to build an entirely new gas turbine power plant. I mean, it was yeah. well, I think $50 that, million yeah. dollars in capital cost and a lot less gas getting burned. Well, of course, yeah. you think, too, about rooftop solar and how mm -hmm. it plays into to a smart grid. You really need to have, you know, it, it enables a sort of a distributed Internet-like mm -hmm. power grid at some point. Where, yeah. And there's companies who are building their own, their own power uh, plants, mm -hmm. it's kind of going back to the future. Right, you know? right, right. Uh, but in order to do that, more intelligence really matters. Yeah, and the thing, one of the things interesting about that story is that they're having their own collision in the same way we've seen like a collision between dev and ops. Yeah. They're yeah. seeing that between operational engineers and IT engineers inside mm -hmm. of the utility space. Because um, a lot of the equipment, if you drive by a substation now, a lot of the equipment is actually provided by network mm -hmm. manufacturers we'd recognize from around here. Yeah. And those sensors were in fact that way. So one of the things we're wondering about is, you know, right now if you get an electrical engineering degree from most universities, you take one programming class. Yeah. We're wondering if we'll see a significant change in that. People in those fields will have to become more yeah. sort of IT, computer savvy, and vice versa. We certainly see people who are software developers becoming very interested in learning electrical engineering and, um, and related engineering fields. Yeah. But so, uh, you know, I think one of the things to watch for is how much yeah. we see mergers in yeah, I, sort I of job I think, title. I, I think that's totally true. I mean, there's this a huge class of startup of the future that includes, uh, you know, the, the new startup team will be the industrial designer plus the data guy or, or gal mm -hmm. uh, plus the, um, uh, you know, software engineer. Mm -hmm. 
you know, it's it's no longer going to be. Oh right. yeah, this is the hardware and guys. Probably some mechanical engineering yeah. even. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, right. We yeah. see a lot of it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so, we're going to ask if we should take some questions. I was about to ask that. I was thinking the same thing. Yeah. Why don't we do that? So the question, just before we got on a microphone, was who has the edge, Silicon Valley or entrenched companies in the space? And I think that's a really good question. I don't think uh, I know the answer. You know, I would guess that the answer is they each have their own kind of edge. Mm -hmm. And uh, But I, I guess I would say, uh, there will also be companies that uh, you know, will remake themselves. You know, if you look at how Apple remade itself as a smartphone and tablet company, right? You know, there, there'll be somebody who's a and also ran uh, from the you know web era, say, mm -hmm. and they'll figure something out yeah. in hardware and they'll they'll come back. Yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, and um, yeah, I mean, certainly. A lot of big players, if they can sort of get o over the conceptual barriers of how yeah. they think, they have the resources to do really amazing things. Yeah. And you know, we're seeing some evidence of that of companies that are really, you know, grabbing the bull by the horns and, and changing, you know, even down to the business models, you know, instead of selling right. things, we sell those things as a service and we manage them remotely and we use the data to run them better and all those kinds of things. So right. we see people doing that stuff. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I think that the you know, the, the, what I mentioned earlier about being able to do lean with hardware now yeah. does give an advantage to small yeah. startups that can do interesting, you know, really yeah. fast but, things. Yeah, but you know, the, the kind of uh, point is, I, I had learned something interesting recently which I hadn't uh, quite understood. Uh, Graham Weston, who started Rackspace, mm -hmm. was actually a real estate developer. Interesting. I, I didn't, I didn't, didn't know, know that. that, and it was just, uh, it was in the early days of the internet. He was yeah. sort of bringing in. He was building. Data he, he was bringing in, you know, high-speed internet to his mm -hmm. buildings, and then he was like, "Well, we got to have service." And he was like, "Well, if I want it, so does everybody else." Yeah. And so he hired, uh, you know, That's some developers great. to kind of start building out the service. And so you could have, like, a, you know, it's important not just to think about well the tech incumbents mm -hmm. versus the, um, you know, the the tech startups. Right. It could be there's somebody who has a vast chain of parking garages who says, oh wait, I'm going to yeah. remake, you know, the yeah. way parking works. Or uh, there's somebody who has, uh, you know, a chain of, of uh, you know, self-storage facilities mm -hmm. who says, oh yeah, I'm going to be the Uber of self-storage, right. you know, right, uh, you know right. or whatever, you know, there are also a bunch of startups working on that, yeah. you know, and maybe, you know, you'll, out of the blue, you'll go, wow, this, mm -hmm. this cool new startup just got acquired by some company I never heard of that has a m m mass, massive chain of, right. of storage lockers. You know? You know, uh, we'll, we'll take another question in a second, but just I want to throw in one other thing that I think is sort of orthogonal to that question is the fact that this stuff opens up avenues for doing things in other environments. So yeah. in third world, for example, um, yeah. you know, the internet.org stuff that's come out of Facebook really is about yeah. taking open compute and it's easier to produce hardware yeah. and produce whole different services at a cost level that wouldn't right. let them be deployed before. Well, and so. also just different ways of, of thinking about the problem. You know, when we saw that Facebook acquired a, a drone company, you know, high flying solar drone, you know, solar powered drones. Mm -hmm. And well, they, they talked about it. They didn't actually close on it. Oh, they didn't no, close no, that. I'm yeah, sorry, I missed yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, but the, the, you know, the notion of, you know, or, or Google's Project Loon, mm -hmm. you know, it's like we're going to actually try to provide internet access using, yeah. uh, you know, right. new kinds of hardware in markets that are currently underserved. Yeah. So should we ease our reliance on China for manufacturing and should we invest more in local manufacturing? Um, I have a lot of thoughts on that. I'm not sure I will share all of them. <laughs> I think um, there's a, there are, there, there are, there is an ecosystem over there that's developing, that's advanced, that's really really useful to tap into. I think China, um, like some other developing economies before it, is in the midst of a major rebalancing, I think, um, and they're trying to forestall it a bit, but rate, wages are going to go up, exchange rates are going to change. I would just be a little careful what bets I placed over there uh, in the near term, well, frankly. I guess the other thing I would say is that there's a, a, a should kind of, uh, there's different ways of saying it. Mm -hmm. Should the U.S. invest in local manufacturing? Um, you know, I, I think that's too simplistic a question because, of course, you'll get a lot of, of, of bad investment from people who are trying to make the world go where it does not want to go. Right, right. You know, can the U.S. Involve, invest in local manufacturing or can, you know, 
developed countries, of, mm -hmm. uh, not just uh, uh, you know the U.S. And the answer is absolutely yes. They have to be smart about. It. They have to understand where it's happening, mm -hmm. and go with you know the energy of what is actually. The, happening. the driving force there is something I alluded to earlier, which is in markets where closing the loop and moving fast is more important. You'll yeah. see more of the manufacturing return. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing is, frankly, uh, the open question of um, to what degree you're building your business around IP that you want to keep private. Um, yeah. That's you know, another, benef another reason why people keep things close. That's so, a good point. Yeah. So the question is, is uh, the announcement of Internet of Things funding in the UK, will that have an impact on anything here? Uh, I don't know. I don't have a point of view on that, yeah. actually. The thing I, I would say uh, right off is there's already a, a huge amount of US funding in this area. You know, mm -hmm. for example, we heard the announcement of all those companies that uh, uh, Google bought. Mm -hmm. They were all DARPA funded. Yeah. You know, in fact, my son-in-law was at the DARPA <laughs> robotics uh, competition. He said it was kind of like, well, it's it's sort of like the the, the fairly well because these all, every one of these companies now, you know, yeah. is uh, is part of Google. Well, so. and certainly the venture community has yeah. woken up to the idea of hardware. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, but I mean, I think I think the government has funded a lot of stuff here. Yeah. And we, w once again, as before, you know, it's like the, uh, you know, the, the original design of, of, uh, of modern computing, you know, was funded by the government you know, way back in the right. 40s. Yeah. You know, the early internet work, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about here in solid was actual government funding. Right. So right. Um, the UK, if they're piling a lot more money onto it, is, is, is just adding to this thing that we all take for granted that the government does fund a lot of basic research which underpins a lot of the great stuff that happens in the private sector. And that's how it should be. Yeah. You know, the government actually you know, building a commons that we can then mine. I actually, uh, so the question is, is there's a couple of uh, programs that have announced Internet of Things, engineering related programs, degrees. Uh, yeah, in the UK and both in the US, will there be more? I know there are more because I've actually seen others just recently. I don't remember the name of the university I saw. Um, I think it's fascinating. I think it actually is it's a reflection of that question I asked earlier, which is if this is a field like robotics that is yeah. developing to be very cross-disciplinary, and in the existing ap academic environment, it's very difficult to cross those disciplines. I actually spent some time at uh, Georgia Tech, one of the uh, schools Kathy mentioned, uh, this year, and you know, they've been pushing the envelope very hard on taking their industrial designers, for example, and teaching them how to prototype hardware devices, yeah. which is, you know, and do software development around it, which is really different. I mean, that's not a part of that program historically. But I suspect we'll see more of this. I don't know if they'll last. I don't know, yeah. you know, I don't know if that's a flash well, in the pan. I, I would say that there will be new startup clusters precisely because of some universities taking a, you know, mm -hmm. a leading edge on this kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, and I, I totally expect way more in the way of, uh, of programs. I remember back, you know, I don't know, it must have been five years ago telling, you know, a bunch of university friends, you know, you should have a, you know, a, a, a data science degree, mm -hmm. you know, and sure enough now there's all these data science degrees yeah. and, and there's going to be, a, I don't know what we're going to, we haven't quite have a name for this space yet, but there right. are going to be degrees absolutely that are targeted at this convergence of hardware yeah. and software. Yeah. And, well, and probably more than one kind of them. Like the yeah, difference yeah. between what's going on in industrial with smart grid and smart cities and things and what's happening maybe at the consumer end or maybe are different enough that those become different yeah. clusters. I don't know. Okay, um, Keep them coming. How important is open standards? <laughs> how important is open standards? It's hugely important and they're, they're, a lot of them are really lacking right now. I mean, I think, um, you know, we're, we are talking about this in terms of art of the possible. We are trying to get people excited because we do see this as, like you mentioned that you know, 10, 15 years ago, you were talking about 3D printers and yeah. O'Reilly stuff. But it does feel like this is a moment where things are ready to sort of fall over. Yeah. And, um, but uh, there really is one, I think, significant uh, um, thing standing in the way right now is, that, is the inability to um, uh, connect stuff together. And not just at the consumer level, um, but across the stack. I and mean, we see it in the industrial spaces as well. People are building things for their own sort of ecosystems. Yeah, you know, I, I actually think it's probably more important in the industrial space than in the consumer space. Uh, you know, what we've really seen from the mobile world is that consumers seem willing to accept, you know, proprietary uh, stacks. Yeah. You know, basically, uh, you know, there's the Google world and the Apple world, and people 
can't really cross over between them very easily. Right, right. And that, you know, so for those of us who grew up in the glory days of the web and the internet, all, all sort of everything interoperable, and that was the big driver uh, of, uh, of innovation, it's, it's a bit of a bitter pill, yeah. uh, but I think it's also real, realistic. I think, though, on the industrial side, uh, you know, there's going to be, there's an opportunity to unlock so much more innovation. Right. You know, the, 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 you know the, the, the platforms that we see on the consumer side are, quote, open enough that developers can build on them. There's yeah. people there who are thinking platform. Right. Whereas in the industrial space, you know, you have a big company and their idea of a platform is, yeah, us and our existing customers, right, right, you know, we'll right. work together on a few right. things. That's what the smartphone, you know, used to look like before the iPhone. Right. You know, where it was like, you know, the vendors got to, you know, the different levels of the stack got together in the back room, the carrier, the manufacturer, and a few chosen developers, and, yeah. and that was all you got. And the industrial internet, so to speak, is still in that, you know, stage, and doesn't get any of the of the the incredible innovation network effects that you get when you have open standards. Right, I mean, I, I think um, I, you and I have talked before, I love this notion from Jonathan Zetrain of generativity, which yeah. is this idea of innovation coming from unexpected quarters because yeah. a system enables it. And um, I think open standards are hugely important to the possibility of generativity in both yeah. industrial and consumer side. Um, and without it, it's, it, it is an exponential difference in the amount of, uh, amount of innovation that comes yeah. out of it. And we see it actually at both ends. We see it in the hardware side. We see it with, um, uh, you know, the high end with Facebook's mm -hmm. Open Compute project. Yeah. At the low end, uh, you know, with things like Arduino, mm -hmm. you know, where, where open source is starting to, to play out. Yeah. And uh, I think that that will continue to, yeah. to kind of creep up the stack. Yeah and down the stack. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the question is, what, what, what is the stuff that matters in this? I think, there's, I think there's a lot of answers to that. Everything from, I mean, there's tremendous opportunity to improve efficiency. You mentioned things like global climate change and so how we use power, how we incorporate other power sources into what we do. This stuff is going to show up all over the medical field. Um, yeah. We're going to see a lot of opportunity to help people live better lives, both through how they take care of themselves before they need medical help and later um, yeah, how they uh, manage it. When I, when I think about stuff that matters, healthcare, as you say, top, top of the list, mm -hmm. uh, environmental, mm -hmm. uh, also you know, super high yeah. on the list. Uh, but also I think uh, you know, making, there are a lot of ways that we're gonna be using this technology uh, to make people's lives better. When we think about healthcare, we think about, well, actually people who are sick. Right. But you know, if you have an elderly parent, the ability to keep track of them, right. Um, you know, uh, heck, you can think of the Fitbit as a healthcare device. I mean, a lot of people are improving their health oh, before they need healthcare. By yeah, yeah. And, and the question is, how do you, you know, when we, we will come to a world where certain kinds, you know, I think back, you know, ten, that's actually fifteen years ago now. You know, my my former mother-in-law had a stroke while mm -hmm. we were in Europe and lay on the floor of her house alone for six days. Oh, Jesus. Wow. You know, it's just horrible. And you go, that should never happen. Right, wow. You know, because, and in a future where we are more connected, you go, well, they probably, you know, for a lot of people that won't happen. Mm -hmm. and, and the you know, the question of, you know, did people take their medication? Did, you know, are they showing up? Right. You know, uh, um, you know th that's the side of all the data tracking that we're going to go, gosh, I'm so glad yeah. that I'm able to look in and that I, that I have this sort of constant digital heartbeat that's telling me that my mm -hmm. loved one is okay. Right. Uh, so and, and even that'll grow to be less sort of like trigger-based and more contextual. You know, yeah, it'll, yeah. Be, it'll be sort of yeah. learning systems yeah. behind that as well. So how do we manage hacking Internet of Things components from a systems-wide point of view? You know, I, I guess I would say a couple of things. Uh, if you have high value devices, data, uh, you know, that's accessible to the Internet of Things, you should be thinking really, really, really seriously about this. You know, if you're the power grid, you know, mm -hmm. you know, and you're not thinking about SCADA security, you know, you're, you're absolutely nuts. Right. You know, if you, uh, even, you know, if you're using, you know, some of the newer kinds of 
consumer devices. You know, I've got my iPhone enabled, you know, door locks on my house. You know, maybe you should be worried, you know. But in general, I would love to see, you know, things break and get fixed rather than we spend a whole lot of time trying to prevent them from ever breaking. You know, because almost every technology that I've watched in my career has started out, you know, with this blaze of hope ended up looking like crap because people could do all kinds of things with it that you know were stupid that didn't work very well right. that you know and then by by working through those problems we got to a much better place and, and yeah. i just i, I you, you want some degree of anticipation of problems but boy if you want to understand how going too far down that path will go just try working in government. I've, I've had a good view of that, but you, in the last couple of years, you know, there's so many things that would be great. Right. And somebody says, but what about? It turns out that the surest way to increase risk is try to eliminate all of it. Yeah, that's you right. Because stop everything. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I will add this. I mean, so you and I have had this conversation before, too. Yeah. You're, you're an optimist. I'm a pessimist that drags myself to being a <laughs> pragmatist <laughs> through yeah. force of will. Um, I do think this is an important conversation in the sense that we have a lot of people developing systems now that include hardware components, physical pieces, yeah. whose backgrounds weren't necessarily in that. And it does require a push a little harder than usual to get people thinking about the implications of what they're doing. Yeah. Um, so I think it's, I don't think, um, and I'll just throw out one other thing. I think if a thing is all by itself out there in the network and can be hacked, it's, yeah. a, it's sort of easy for that to go un unnoticed. The more things are woven together, then I think the more opportunity there is to sort of understand. And in the same way that a person who has lots of ways they're presenting their identity have a harder time disappearing, yeah. um, I think we'll see uh, these things resolved yeah. in, in ways we're not quite expecting right now. Sure. Uh, but you know, the other thing you think about are all of the security risks or you know, risks of all kinds that could be mitigated by these technologies. You know, everybody focuses, for example, on, oh my gosh, what happens if the driverless car gets in an accident? Well, you go, well, Humans get in accidents yeah. all the time. There's a lot of evidence that I, driverless cars will get in fewer I think accidents. I think the one thing that's left unexamined in this that was, yeah. uh, was worth mentioning is that there is a asymmetry to the security problem once it goes digital. Yeah. You know, you mentioned earlier, right, my house has windows. That's true, but somebody has to be within 30 feet of them to throw a rock through them, yeah. which at least makes possible that they'll be apprehended even if they might yeah, not yeah, be. Yeah. Uh, the, the asymmetry here is a little different and it's worth Yeah, no, that's fair. Out. Why don't we take uh, one more, uh, one or two more, yeah. So the question is, how do you get started? This is like a softball, come to solid for starters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, th I think there's uh, also, if you were a, I presumably coming from a software person, uh, uh, I think there's lots of opportunities to start getting engaged with hardware to understand what's possible. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I mean, certainly, you know, if you look at, at Maker Faire, it's certainly oriented much more towards families, uh, but gives you a, a, a big landscape of what mm -hmm. people are doing. Uh, you know, you, there's, right. there's sites like uh, Adafruit on the electronic side, yeah. uh, you know, and, and you know, Make Magazine in general that kind of gives you the chance to sort of experience a lot of these things as a hobbyist. Right. Uh, and that's a great way to get started uh, with any new technology yeah. is just, you know, playing with it. Play around with it, build um, something. Yeah. You know, I think, as I say, there are some great programs, uh, you know, at a number of universities that you can look at. Uh, but I think you are uh, raising a, a good point and one that, we should be really focused on at O'Reilly, which is what, what, what kind of material should we be producing to yeah. teach people what they need to do. So we are doing some things, so we have some projects in, in, in progress now for like, um, you know, hardware for hackers kinds of things. You yeah. know, how do you sort of like, what are the ele electrical engineering basics that, basics you, that you want to know if you're a software developer starting to think about things like this, but we need to do a lot more. And yeah. frankly, we need to ask the people that ask that question to help us understand where they're coming from, what they need. Yeah. yeah. Let me take a, I think we have time for one more. No. Are we optimistic about the future? Absolutely, I am, yeah. So, uh, I, despite the fact that you said I'm an optimist, uh, <laughs> I, always, uh, I always think when I talk to the singularity people, you know, uh, you know, I, I was a classicist, and uh, um, Rome did fall, and, you know, the, the world didn't end, progress didn't end, right. but there are a lot of examples that, of where we didn't go very far for a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, I was in Istanbul a few years back and I, you know, went to see the Hagia Sophia, you know, which, you know, 
was the largest building in the world in the fourth century. And guess what? It was the largest building in the world for a thousand years. Yeah. And the next largest building was the Blue Mosque, uh, you know, which they built as a copy of it a thousand years later, you know, a quarter mile away. Yeah. You know, it, so, you know, we have possibilities of setbacks. And the thing that I am least optimistic about is there's sort of an anti-science, anti-technology -te uh, undercurrent in modern US politics, mm -hmm. which is utterly frightening to me. Yeah. Because if you look at the fall of Rome, there was an anti-intellectualism that went with it. You know, yeah. uh, you know uh, the you know, astronomer Hypatia being stoned to death in Egypt. You mm -hmm. know, basically, she was too smart for her own good. You yeah. know? She was, uh, you know, that became this, you know, who are these, these uh, you know, snobs right. who think they're too good for the rest of us. And we could have a, so um, uh, just here's my worst case scenario. You imagine this huge anti-technology, anti-science, you know, mm -hmm. uh, backlash at the same time as we're being hit by problems like global warming. Access to water, uh, et cetera, you know, yeah. uh, You know, water stress, you know, all these kinds of things, energy that goes, you know, again, we have, mm -hmm. we, 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 you know, we may luck out, but I wouldn't just, you know, we can't count on it. And that's why I do think it's important for us to, to care about these issues and to take all this technology and use it to solve real problems that make a difference in people's lives uh, so that they go, whoa, yeah. uh, you know, I don't want to lose that. Right. And, uh, you know, so, so yes, I'm optimistic, but I always have in, in my back pocket, you know, from time to time in human affairs, things go really south. And for crazy reasons, we don't understand why people go so irrational. Yeah. You know, again, there's a wonderful book that uh, I love called The Perfect Summer, about the summer before World War I started, right. you know? Right, right. <laughs> it's like it was like everything seemed to be going just so well, yeah. and then bang, you know, yeah. so. And I'll just, I'll, I'll throw yeah. in something slightly different on that, which is that if you look at the history of technology prior to computing, you know, um, James Watt and his contemporaries thought they were building a steam engine and the Industrial Revolution, but at the same time, they sort of accidentally built uh, modernism and all the political isms that went with it. Yeah. Those were direct results of the societal changes that came from the technology yeah. change. And I think given the context of um, what's happening in the world, there are stressors that are going to be impinging on governments of all kinds. When we mix in what's happening with technology, we really do have to focus on making sure that we deal with the privacy things, et cetera, and the security things so that there isn't as much of a backlash. Yeah. And we also have to take seriously that our institutions need to be remade. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have this huge uh, gulf right now between the speed of innovation in the private sector and right. the speed of innovation in government, yeah. for instance, which is why I'm spending so much of my time in that area. Because if, you know, I believe that government plays a vital role in our society, and to the extent that it becomes so unbelievably less capable than the private sector, yeah. you know, it can't do its job. I love the question of if Madison were alive today with the same principles in his mind, and we d did the Constitution today for the first time instead of in 1787, what form would that take? Yeah, you know? it's a good question. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah. lots of things to be optimistic yeah. about, but lots of things to be worried about, or more precisely, to care about, yeah. and to work hard to get right. Yeah. So. Um, I think that's winding down our time. I hope we see a lot of people at Solid. I wanted to throw out there, we're going to have a startup showcase. If you have a hardware-related startup and you have not submitted to that, please do. You can find the information online. Um, we'll be announcing our Solid fellows soon. They'll all be uh, demonstrating what they've been working on at Solid. And we have yeah. an amazing lineup of speakers that are going to be diving deeper and deeper into the conversation we just had in all different kinds of ways there. Yeah, and, and uh, really, I think getting, we, we've been very much at the high level uh, you know, getting into the specifics of, you mm -hmm. know, here's what we built, here's how we built it. Yeah. Uh, you know, really kind of, uh, we want a lot more people uh, on this train. And we want people to see things and touch it with their own hands. So we're going to have a bunch of stuff there. We're going to have some robots and other things on display so people can get a sense, a visceral sense of what all this stuff means. And it's not just a sort of us standing on stage talking about it or yeah. sitting in front of the camera talking about it. So. All right. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody.